please welcome Julian Blicker. Thanks, Laurent. Um, I do work in Nokia. I'm a designer there. I work in a, in a studio where we effectively look at new ways in which uh, the future of not just of Nokia, but of all the people that Nokia touches, and there are quite, quite uh, several hundred million of them, uh, how that future can become better and more habitable. And what I want to talk about today isn't so much directly about the work that I do at Nokia, uh, but I want to talk about more a, a strategy for thinking about how you might find those, those new near future habitable kind of places uh, through a strategy that I think a lot of people have been thinking about and um, just trying to think of ways to formalize it maybe a bit. And uh, myself and a lot of other people have been calling it uh, design fiction. And how I want to share this today in this, in this setting is to think about the ways in which uh, the science of, uh, that we usually imagine the future to be composed of is really very much uh, a form of storytelling. And I'll share a bit of that uh, through some examples and then a little bit of um, some background onto this idea. So it just, this is, this is a very interesting machine that I discovered uh, a, a week and a half ago in uh, Linz, Austria. It's, it's actually writing the entire uh, Bible by hand, but it's a robot, robotic hand. It'll take, I think, seven months for it to do it, and it does it in the form of a, of a scribe um, in that same sort of style, which I thought was very interesting. So this is meant to tie into this idea that stories are uh, the bedrock of our society and the way in which we think about not just how we live today, how we lived in the past in the form of history, but also how we can think about the future. As one of my favorite quotes, I'm sure very many of you are familiar with it, uh, William Gibson who says, as I've said many times, the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed. And this is, uh, to me, a very, uh, very important quote from a very important science fiction writer who helps uh, people who work in the, the area of um, sort of high technology to think about the way in which the, their, their futures that they're trying to create are affected. And at the time that I read this uh, uh, book, Neuromancer, by William Gibson, which is the first bit of science fiction that really kind of impacted me in a, in a, in a very deep way, I was working in a lab uh, at the University of Washington in Seattle and there was a lot of work going on with virtual reality. And this was in the, uh, I guess it was been the early 90s. And it was such a new technology, and the ideas were so very early and formative, and no one was really sure, the sort of idea about how the technology works, but not really a deep understanding about it, what it meant for, for people, for just everyday people. And this, in the story Neuromancer, uh, if you remember it, if you don't, I'll explain just briefly that uh, the the main sort of technology that that was that you find throughout the story was a kind of uh, future form of this technology that we were actually working on in the lab, and so very quickly a lot of the ideas and the plots and the names of technologies that William Gibson pinned in his book became the things that we actually used to describe what we were working on in the lab. So we would we would talk about, uh, Gibson talks about the cyberspace deck, which is basically a kind of computer that you use to get onto the cyberspace world that he described. And so we started describing the technology that we were building as a deck. And it just became a way in which we could uh, expand our imagination, expand the possibilities that we were thinking about through this bit of fiction. So how do you do this? Well, I think there's a, quite a bit of undisciplined kind of activity that goes on because usually science and science fiction, so science fact and science fiction usually don't mix particularly well. So, and there are a lot of you know, pr good reasons for that. As scientists, uh, if their work sort of moves into the area of very speculative kind of things that's not well formed in the usual ways in which scientific fact is developed, uh, then they, they, they sort of move beyond the professional constraints of what they're meant to be doing. And I, I've got a very kind of mixed mixed background in terms of my intellectual history. So I have a background in electrical engineering and computer science, so very hard, formal kind of engineering guy. But then I got this doctorate, uh, and the doctorate was in the, is called History of Consciousness, and basically it was a history of ideas, what I was studying. And uh, it, was, it was particularly poignant because at the time I graduated, um, he's still governor of California, Arnold Schwarzenegger, so he was governor of California when I graduated, and I happened to actually write about the film Terminator while I was doing the doctorate. So there's a little bit of poetic justice that he actually signed, signed my diploma. So the, the work that I wrote on was uh, looking at the ways in which 
uh, science and technology uh, sort of mix in a way to create this sort of um, vision of the future and the various ways in which techniques and technologies that science draws upon in order to create uh, conversations effectively about what the future should look like. And so I call this the reality effect of technoscience, a sort of uh, way of mixing uh, not just engineering, but different aspects of, uh, of, how, of, of how society works. And one of the things that I learned is that there are a couple ways in which knowledge about the future is created, in which uh, the things that come to be in a year or two years or 15 years are um, very much a mix of both these material practices, so engineers actually making things, designing computers, uh, developing new kinds of um, switching technology, faster networks, and these kinds of things, and how they're very much enrolled and sort of wrapped up in stories about what those futures, futures could be. So the communication of these technologies, of these kind of material artifacts, new kinds of computers, is as important as the technology itself. And if you think about some of the big innovations that have been going on uh, in recent history, we can think about the ways in which these stories were created to help people imagine what the possible world would be with this new technology. So the technology by itself, engineers usually aren't particularly good at telling stories that help people bring into, uh, into their fold, into, uh, into sort of a deep conversation about what they're trying to develop. So one of the ways in which you might look at um, the, the kind of disconnect between uh, the hard technology and the stories that sort of fold into them is a little practice that, uh, that we sort of developed in the, in the studio where we'll take an idea and we'll deliberately turn it on its head. So that bit of inversion, taking something that uh, where you expect the future to point in one particular direction, and then at, for the purposes of just exploring that future a little bit more, invert it and do something sort of very strange to it in order to force people to think about what those stories might be. So in this case, this is a device that, uh, that I built, and it's called, uh, sorry, it's called a slow messenger. So it does the opposite of what you might think typical messaging does. So rather than doing messaging very quickly, it does it very slowly. And that's just meant to be a sort of provocation to get people to think about, do we really want our technologies to move faster? Do we want our communication to happen just at, at, uh, as fast as it can when there might be circumstances in which it happening slower might be sort of either beneficial to, our, or to, our, to ourselves or beneficial in a way that there might be a new mode of communication where speed isn't the primary concern. This is just sort of another version of it that we developed. Uh, this is a project by, by a friend and colleague of mine at Nokia where he develops uh, these new kind of uh, measuring instruments. And they're all, you know, the kinds of things that you look at them right away and you say these, these would definitely look like they measure things. Um, it does these very wonderful sketches of these things. And then finally we sort of um, take them to a next stage and sort of materialize and put them in physical form. So this is a, uh, a typical triangle that you might see in an architect's office, but all the dimensions are deliberately something other than the conventional uh, either centimeters or inches or this kind of thing. So along one axis you measure people, another axis you measure um, speed, another one you measure technology. Now there's nothing typical that you can measure with that. It's meant to be a way of thinking about uh, new ways of measuring. And this is one of them actually uh, actually cut out. So the purpose of this part of, uh, of mixing science and storytelling is to remind ourselves that things don't always have to be the way we expect them to be. They can sort of move into different directions. So rather than uh, a measuring instrument just you know, a quantifying the distance or size of things, it might quantify other aspects. And so the objective here is to swerve the ways in which we understand the world swerve the ways in which we make me meaning. And this is where I think uh, some of the very simple early history of science and the way in which knowledge is created is really interesting to look at. So this is a book, it was, it was called Leviathan and the Air Pump. It's basically a history of, of um, Thomas uh, Hobbes and, and Boyle and their work into develop different theories about how, what kind of knowledge can be scientific knowledge. And so one of the things that Boyle did is he developed a, he was working on the science of vacuums. And so he developed this, uh, this apparatus that allowed him to prove that there could be, that the, a vacuum could exist within this chamber. Now this at the time was, uh, this is something that we, you might take for granted today, but back in the 16th century, this was big science. So this was the equivalent of creating a, uh, you know, a, a cyclotron back in the day. So there was no, all the mechanisms for creating, first of all, a big a glass sphere, sphere like this were um, unknown. So it was a lot of experimentation just to create 
the actual apparatus. And sorry, this isn't working very well. What was interesting here is that there was uh, underneath. Can you maybe? Uh, underneath, there was, which you never saw in this sort of experimental theater, and it was very much a theater. It was like a, uh, almost a performance, where people would come and sort of look at the science, the, the science that was going on, and there was an elaborate bit of this storytelling element that went along with it. And what I found curious was that underneath the stage, you wouldn't see where all the really heavy, heavy lifting would go, was going on, and it was almost like watching a film or watching a theatrical production and not realizing that there's so much more going on behind the scenes. So what, what Boyle uh, developed were basically described as like these three ways of creating knowledge. And one of the ways was this sort of material technology. So this is what engineers do. They make the actual components, they make the device, they make the computer, whatever it might be. And then there was this, importantly, this, this sort of literary technology that was described as a way of essentially telling the story of what the technology did. And so for Boyle, telling the story of the technology was, uh, was almost as laborious as actually doing the actual engineering. So it was a matter of finding the right communication strategies, what we would call today, to convince people that what he was doing was worthy scientific knowledge production. And then finally, the social technology, which uh, was a way of distributing this knowledge. So at the time, it wasn't a matter of obviously going online and doing a blog post and saying, look what I discovered. There was, there was an elaborate mechanism for actually disseminating the knowledge, getting it approved by other people. So they said, this is good, you should, I'll pass it on to someone else. And then you have to remember that it wasn't easy to package that information. So even printing material was, was uh, required uh, quite a bit of work. Oops. So, um, I, what I sort of call this is like the special effect. So it's not a special, it's, it's sort of a special effect in the sense of um, the way films produce special effects, but it's also a, an effect that's special in the sense that it kind of tips things over from an idea to an actual bit of knowledge, to something that is much bigger than just a couple of people thinking about something. And that's what these guys underneath the stage are doing. They're actually going through this process of doing the special effect, doing the behind the scenes production work in order to make the apparatus work. And I just have there, this, for me, what, how, how this works in the sort of modern age, like now, is in uh, film, particularly science fiction film. And I, tons of wonderful examples of, of a science film, I'll just sort of start this one. So you all, this is Minority Report, and what's interesting about this film to me is that it, uh, it sort of became a, a primary reference point when people talked about touch technology. So someone would say, touch technology, what are you talking about? Well, it's kind of like that thing in Minority Report. And people would be like, ah, okay, I got it. And the film, and the story of the film, and the production of the film became a really powerful and effective way of conveying what this engineering, bit of engineering work was, which might have been quite obscure without uh, you know, an, an effective vehicle through which to tell the story about what the engineering could possibly do. So in a sense, it was, uh, this is a kind of a, a, the literary part of conveying that bit of knowledge production that we went into. And there are a bunch of very interesting side notes to uh, the film, including that the um, John Undercoffler, who worked on the production of the film, is uh, you know, a very smart, very talented, MIT-trained engineer who then went on to develop uh, various forms of touch, touch technology that effectively he prototyped uh, conceptually in the film. And then, of course, you have wonderful storytelling abilities Visual storytelling abilities of someone like uh, Stephen King. He looked familiar. Who? Oh man, standing in the park. Uh, and then there, there's all these kind of interest, interesting, intricate overlaps. So this was a, a new segment that was done Hollywood, now around the, the production of Minority Report that went from Minority Report, the and then in uh, half a beat here in goes in Angeles, uh, between fact and fiction as a title of the from the film and to the actual the work of John Undercoffer's engineering company as he develops the technology, which, which is uh, it's quite male, nice, quite impressive female, technology. In the movie, so the point here is that the there's that intricate overlap between what is fact and what is fiction, and in a very productive way, uh, a visual story like a science fiction film is able to reinforce and 
um, develop and sort of further, uh, to further move along uh, interesting technologies. Uh, the same thing you can think of with, with the film Jurassic Park, where there was uh, a lot of very deliberate and very interesting and very exciting overlap between this, uh, the, you know, the, the, the Crichton book, Jurassic Park, Steven Spielberg film about dinosaurs that followed that, and then all the kind of quasi-marketing um, exhibitions that happened around it at a lot of museums, particularly in, in the United States, where there were Jurassic Park exhibits, so you could learn about dinosaurs while you're learning about, uh, through the, essentially through the film. Uh, 2001 is another very uh, interesting example of this crosstalk between uh, science fiction storytelling and, and technology production. What's interesting about this film is that uh, there, was, uh, there, was, there were actual engineers. So the time the film was being produced was at the same time that the United States was developing the Apollo, uh, Apollo space program. So people really didn't quite know what the story was with, with, uh, with actual space travel. I mean, it was... It was um, it was just a lot of question marks. Didn't know if it would work, didn't know if astronauts would survive, didn't know how we'd get them back, and all these kinds of things. And at the same time, uh, a film is being produced um, that is meant to also tell that story with all these question marks going along with it. So a lot of engineers were actually uh, brought in from the Apollo program to help uh, with the production of the, of the film 2001, which I find very interesting. So it's almost like both the, the film production and the actual uh, space program are both operating at the s simultaneously. So 2001 isn't telling the story about the Apollo program kind of in hindsight. At the exact same moment, they are also trying to speculate about what travel in space in the future might look like. What materials might, be, might, might there be? What might the sound be traveling in outer space? What might the computers be? And a lot of the technology that they exhibited in the film just didn't exist at all. So this is a, um, a still from the film showing uh, a cockpit and uh, of, a, of a, future, um, uh, a, a future spaceship, and no one really knew what they, they would look like. There hadn't even been, the idea of a graphical user interface hadn't even been developed at the time, but nonetheless, the film sort of speculated in, in quite a, a very compelling way what a graphical user interface for a computer might be. This is 1960, uh, 68 and 69. So the idea of a graphical user interface for a computer is, uh, it's like me saying gibberish to you. It, it had no meaning. A lot of very intricate, discerning work. Video telephones, I mean, they've sort of been around, the idea had been uh, shot around, but they thought that it was compelling enough that they were going to um, insert it into the film with exquisite detail. So here's the zero gravity toilet. No one had ever really thought about how you would uh, relieve yourself in, in zero gravity, but they wanted to show that this, you know, kind of gives it a, a sense of um, reality to show it in the film. Uh, I'll skip past uh, Dark Knight, just because of time. Um, and so, I guess, in, in conclusion, the, uh, I'll let this one kind of play. This is um, a film called Death Star Over San Francisco by Michael Horn. And what, what I found exciting about this is that it, it kind of combined a whole bunch of these elements that I'm really, really excited about. So ways of designing, of creating uh, compelling visions of a possible world through a mix of a number of things. So I think visuals are quite important. So telling a story uh, through a, a visual story through film is quite interesting. And then mixing elements that help make it into a compelling story. So you're communicating this vision that you have and doing it in such a way that allows people to kind of get a little hook into it and uh, see what you're seeing and help use that as a way to kind of spur this vision that you created. So what's wonderful about this film is that it was, it was completely DIY. It's just sort of done um, with, with off-the-shelf components and uh, software. And he just manages to put into, uh, into, this, into this story this idea that the, uh, the empires come to San Francisco and sort of um, uh, you know, has deployed a garrison there and sort of causing a little bit of trouble. Um, but it's, it's just sort of things that happen in the, in the edges in the corner. Uh, as if someone was just taking a, a film of their weekend uh, throughout San Francisco.
so I'm just going to skip, skip, skip ahead. So this is, this, is the, this is the central point, is that science fiction can do things that science fact can't. So you can t it's easier, it's, it's hard to tell stories, but it's easier perhaps to tell a story or have a story go along with that bit of uh, science fact that work that you're doing to help populate your ideas, not just with the engineering, not just with the technology, but with that, that element that gives it a, a meaning to people in the, uh, in the sort of normal world, the world outside of the science lab. A lot of that happens to be um, can, happens through fan art. So a lot of the fan art that happens around um, science fiction is people's uh, desire to kind of express themselves more completely. Uh, the Start Starfleet Technical Manual is a um, uh, very interesting example of the way in which fans have actually expanded the the uh, the world of of Star Trek. So this was something that wasn't. Uh, uh, it wasn't commissioned by the producers of Star Trek. Someone just happened to start doing it. Um, and it actually became so popular that it was a New York Times uh, bestseller, which is kind of interesting. Um, and it was because of that, as just sort of side note, because it became a bestseller that the producers of Star Trek decided that it, maybe there actually is a fan base out there and that people really are interested in. They're so interested, they're actually creating these, uh, these extra visions of what Star Trek might be so to the point of actually creating engineering diagrams for some of the props which don't exist at all i mean these were just uh, foam cutouts but someone went through the trouble of actually designing what it might look like and this is quite interesting because it's you know it's got a cathode ray tube it tube in it and all these kinds of wonderful things and all these things sort of anticipate things like mobile phones and all kinds of other wonderful things. So in conclusion, this is my concluding slide. This is a, an image that a, a colleague of mine made. Um, the crafting those visions, sharing those sort of visual stories about what a possible world could look like is probably the, uh, the, the most difficult part and the most uh, exciting and challenging and important part about telling stories about new possible worlds being able to have the vision not just of what the technology could do, so not just faster networks, not just smaller phones, not just uh, you know, faster this, that, or the other thing, but imagining what those, what those little bits of engineering work might do to create and shape and uh, hopefully give us a more habitable, more playful world. Thank you. Thank you, Julian. Julian is coming off the plane. <laughs>